Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua, and today we have Elena Timofeva here, and it's going to absolutely blow your mind. This conversation is incredible. Actually, it's her answers that are incredible. I just finished the broadcast, and it's it's really, really neat. Uh, Elena's story is really powerful. And if you're a woman in the in the tech industry, or you're just somebody that's part of the underserved population, uh, she is going to absolutely inspire you. In fact, I think this is really inspiring for anyone, but specifically for the underserved and for the female population, uh, you're gonna find this to be quite inspiring, even if actually, even if you're an immigrant, uh, if you're an immigrant from any country, this is gonna be special and hopefully inspire you and show you that it doesn't matter what hand that you're dealt in life, you can succeed, you can make your dreams come true. And, and regardless of what obstacles Elena's faced, in fact, I learned of some new obstacles in this in this interview, um, to hear what she's going through and to hear what she's doing about, doing about it is so inspiring. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elena Timofeva to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Bergla. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to introduce you all to Alina Timofeva. Alina, welcome to the broadcast. How are you today? Thank you so much. Yes, I'm doing great. Thank you. Good to have you here. All right, I, before we get into the 21 questions, and I'm really excited to ask you these questions because there's so much to learn from you. But before we get into that, will you tell me, what are you grateful for today? and why i just got five hours of photo shoot for my business so i'm pretty happy you got five hours of what of photo shoot for my business oh that's awesome well yeah. you do look nice congratulations on that yes thank you thank you quite a lot of outfits <laughs> so are you ready for your 21 questions yeah yeah of course okay question number one your journey from post-Soviet Russia to become a tech leader in the UK is inspiring. What cultural shock or challenge surprised you the most and how did you overcome it? Well, I think the main one is obviously the Russian people and the British people are very different in the mindset. So I was brought up to be a housewife and the main cultural shock was I need to come to UK and to make the money. And I was pretty good at making money and I was pretty bad at being a housewife. But I guess it was the whole uh, process of transformation. Excellent. Question two. You've won numerous awards in the tech industry. Which one holds the most personal significance for you and why? So I won one award, which is most inspirational person of the year in UK. And the reason it's so exciting for me is actually it wasn't something which is you know my day-to-day -day job it's something which i really like doing in my personal time so i've done a ted talk which has more than half a million views i've done quite a lot of podcasts and videos and all the other things which are more targeted at underrepresented groups they're immigrants similar to myself and i was very happy to see that there was such a lot of uptake of the story you know, the story, how I came from Russia to UK, the challenges that I overcame, that people were inspired, the people from various, various, various countries and different languages and different countries. I think I counted it was 150 plus countries. So the award was really to recognize, you know, the job for the humanity rather than, you know, a job which I do just for the purpose of making money. Very cool. Very cool. Number three, your TED Talk fail but never give up, has resonated with millions. Can you share a failure that isn't widely known but is but has significantly shaped your career? Yeah, I mean, the first one is I failed doing Big Macs in McDonald's. So I was pretty bad in that. I didn't get promoted in McDonald's. I was uh, told that maybe I should step away from my responsibilities or perhaps I should, you know, be on a performance improvement plan or a version of it. 
So the funniest thing is whilst I failed in that, I was still pretty good in terms of coming to UK and making my own life here. And I guess it wasn't something which uh, kept me away from persevering further. Amazing. Question four. As a board member of the British Computer Society, what's one unconventional idea you'd like to implement to drive innovation in the tech industry? Okay, so I think the main thing which we're advocating with the government right now is that there are quite a lot of people who are missing from the technology profession. So there are the women, there are the people with the disabilities, and I have incurred a disability, so I am a woman with a disability. And I think seeing more of diversity in the technology industry, not just from the gender side, not just from, I guess, the typical side of diversity, but also having more uh, disabled people uh, being empowered in the technology industry, I think is very important. To your point, um, I'm, what has me so excited about the fourth industrial revolution and all of the changes that are here and are coming is, is you said it, the disabled, the underserved have an opportunity. And without AI, for one, as a tool, I wouldn't be able to do 99.9% .9 of what I'm doing with the efficiency that I'm doing it. Mm. And I'm so grateful because of, you know, even, even when I developed this head thing it's actually all over my body but mainly what you see in my head right now when i developed that i lost the ability to really be able to talk and do a lot of the things i used to be in commercials and do some acting and i can't really do that right now so i lost a lot but because of the tools that are available i was still able to move forward i, I wrote four more books um you know i was able to do a lot of things because of this technology that's allowed me to still have the revenue streams and still participate in society. So I'm very grateful for these technological changes. So I love that you highlighted that. Thank you. Number five, okay. you've worked with lending, I'm sorry, you've worked with leading consulting firms. If you could create a time capsule for the tech industry to open in 50 years, what would you put in it and why? I think the time capsule really, I mean, the technologies come in, the technologies come out, but it's ultimately all about the people, right? So it's about having the people empowered to do the change. And whatever the technology is, if your people are not happy, they won't be able to drive the change. So fundamentally, you know, the TED talk, which I did about fail but never give up, it's the same attitude, whether it's a new technology and old technology, it's whether it's implementation or whether it's something that you need to remediate, it's kind of all the same thing. So you need to continue investing in your people as much as you can, whether they are women or disabled or underrepresented groups, so that they can drive the change. And I personally believe that the companies that, you know, make an effort for the people, you know, the people, they believe in the loyalty of the company and they keep driving the change. This is not on here, but, you know, a lot of if the, the other thing about what's coming in the technology is that people that are disabled, maybe they have trouble being around other people. Maybe mm. there's a, a, a mental disability and it affects yes. the way they have relationships. These tools also help us with that. And it's really exciting. What do you feel, this is again, not a planned question, but what do you feel mo is more likely to happen for the disabled community? Do you think that they're gonna become solopreneurs or do you see the disabled community starting to unite and starting to collaborate with the tools existing or is it going to be a split of both well i think at the moment there is still a bit of a stigma in the workplace around disabled people because obviously i don't know like even if it's not an actual impact on the job you know the fact that you may not want to be around the people that may or the fact that you may come across as more frustrated or irritable it kind of may upset certain people unless they have a full understanding of what the disability is. I mean, in the UK, there are certain laws that protect those with disabilities that kind of say you need to have reasonable adjustments and, you know, people can't have derogatory comments around your conditions and symptoms, etc., etc. But I think uh, they don't, it doesn't always work in practice. And I think that there is more to be done in there. 
uh, partially in terms of educating the broader community about the challenges that disabled people have, but also the opportunities which they can bring to the table. So to answer your question, I think it's a bit of a mix, but I think the main thing is obviously when you have a disability, it's a bit difficult to embed yourself in the society in the same way. So it goes both ways. So one is your self-belief that you can make a change, but the second thing is that the community is willing to, you know, spend time on you or embed you into the society. So I'm hoping that with time, the society would be more open in terms of embedding the entrepreneurs or those from disabled backgrounds. I think if it didn't happen, then I would definitely see more solo entrepreneurs coming in uh, from the disabled communities. Great answer. Thank you. Your background in mathematics is impressive, especially me. I suck at math. <laughs> How do you apply mathematical thinking to solve complex business problems in your current role? I mean, to be frank, when I was uh, studying maths, it was very theoretical. So the idea there was to solve ambiguous problems, which actually don't mean much in the practical world. I think what it does, it just trains your brain to think in various kind of opportunities. I'm personally very good, and I don't know if it's good for mathematics or not, but I'm very good in identifying new opportunities and creating the revenue streams rather than just the, you know, the programming or the coding or the specific, uh, you know, some unique thought leading thing. Yeah. I think people, the businesses are selling kind of the same ideas, roughly. It's more like, do you like the people? Do you like how they market the idea? Do you relate to the content? Do you relate to the people that sell it? And I think that's something which matters. And I guess what I'm trying to do much more now is unite my quantitative skills and my uh, other skills and just being a good person in terms of driving the business. Lovely. Number seven, you're passionate about empowering women in tech. If you could instantly change one aspect of the industry to improve gender equality, what would it be? Well, I think generally with women, we are quite introverted. So I want to see more women in technology to be seen, heard and recognized and not just for the fact that they have a good story or they may have undertaken various adversities in their life, but just for the fact that they're pretty good in tech. Very good. Number eight, cloud computing is one of your areas of expertise. What's the most exciting or concerning cloud related trend you see emerging in the next five years? So you are aware right now about the recent IT global outage. So yeah. one of the things there was the interconnectedness of the various uh, providers, but fundamentally we are very reliant on three key cloud providers right now in the world. So imagine you had CrowdStrike and right now the failure happened because of like one little thing in CrowdStrike that went wrong, but it affected so many people, so many businesses and led to so many losses. But my concern is more the uh, interconnectivity and the fact that we are reliant on the tech giants. And I don't have anything against kind of the tech giants making the business right now, but it's just more thinking more longer term around the resiliency in terms of how it will be done by the companies and the third parties like Microsoft, Amazon and Google, and how this will practically be working towards building the trust with the customer, such as you and I, versus just, you know, making the money. Well said. Number nine, you've spoken at prestigious events like the World Economic Forum. What's one topic you have not addressed but are eager to discuss on the global stage? I think it's pretty cool. I want to do much more of quantum computing. So next year is the year of quantum computing by United Nations. And I think so far it's been more experimental in terms of what is being discussed. Mm -hmm. And I want to be closer to the topic because it is a topic of the future. Agreed. Number 10. As someone who has navigated both academic and corporate worlds, what's one thing universities should teach but don't about succeeding in the tech industry? 
Well, I mean, my education was very different because I was studying in Russian, which was very, very theoretical. So it wasn't the softest skills. For me, the important thing there would have been something on the softer side, maybe the presentation, how you kind of sell yourself or how if you had a business idea, how you sell the business idea. So to give you an example, when I was coming over to UK, I failed to find a job for a long period of time and I couldn't get through maybe 1000 jobs or so. And the rationale was that they thought that I'm very good maths wise and logically and generally I was smart. But the issue was I wasn't soft skilled enough and I couldn't kind of integrate into the real world. Um, and that was a bit of a problem, both when I was working for a job and when I joined my first company. Hmm. Number 11. If you could have a one hour conversation with any historical figure to gain mm. insight for today's tech challenges, mm. who would it be and why? Oh, tech challenges. I mean, it's not necessarily the tech challenges because I'm more on the story of persevering. So I want to speak to Sharon Stone. And just because she's on my mind, and the reason for it is not because she's a big actress, but because she did have this adversity of having a stroke when she was 41. That was making quite a lot of news right now and kind of how she repurposed herself and how she has reimagined herself after it and how this not only did she do it, you know, in terms of making herself successful, but in terms of helping the other people to be seen and heard and recognized. And I think that's a good example. It inspires me also when people take whatever ailment or disability or tragic event or trauma and they turn it and decide to use it as a blessing and a gift because they their healing journey, they share it, they talk about it, they document it, they share how they overcome. So one of my favorite things about life is that we have that opportunity to do for each other. So mm -hmm. I really love that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, number 12, you've mentioned the importance of mentorship. What's the most unconventional piece of advice you're given or you've received as a mentor? Um, I mean, the main thing is probably trust, right? And I think it's difficult because you may have many mentors but this real connection of trust may not be really there so i found it a very long time to find somebody who i really you know like like even though there are official mentors that you could find or unofficial mentors or the mentors that are assigned to you at work so i think it's just finding that person who really wants you to succeed rather than doing it because of uh organization or some sort of a formal agreement. I love that you said that. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> given your experience in risk management, how do you balance innovation with security in your approach to digital transformation? Yeah, so I think I look at it in two sides. So first of all, there is always innovation when you drive the security. Because, for example, if you want to implement various systems to protect your customers, there is always a way to do it in a more innovative way, in a more automatic way, to get the data out of it, to get the analytics out of it. So that is one aspect. The second aspect is many of the people who drive innovation, they hate risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you have to, you know, do all the paperwork and frankly speaking, it is quite boring. So the thing there, which I was advocating, which I was building as part of my programs is for engineers to work closely together through the life cycle of the change and transformation with the people from the risk, from the regulation side, so that you don't do it in isolation where you do something exciting and then risk kills it. But you kind of are driven by the regulatory requirements and then they go into the risk the elements and then they get transformed into the engineering guardrails. So it's kind of this working people together and it's a lot of a mindset change because I think from one point of view, the risk people are more averse and the engineering people are less averse, but it's kind of how do you find a commonality as a team? How can you unite it as a collective success? Great answer. That was awesome. Number 14, your story has been featured in books like Migrant Mag Magic. If you were to write your own book, 
what would be its most surprising chapter? I mean, personally, I do think that generally my life is quite surprising. I think I am quite unconventional and quite crazy in a good way. <laughs> I think I think the surprising chapter, I mean, it's just generally, you know, I don't follow a typical route of, uh, I don't know, either of a housewife or of an engineer or of a transformational consultant. So I think the key thing, for example, what I'm doing with public speaking right now is I'm trying to unite my experience of being a model with the experience of working in technology, with the experience of doing the public speaking and the media pitching. So that is quite different. And I want to change the way the woman in technology is perceived because I don't want it just to be pure, you know, technology or pure woman. I want it to be like every woman that works in technology looks good, talks well, is applauded for what she knows and, you know, deserves to be on the cover of a magazine. Like that. That's good. Number 15, as a judge for various tech awards, what's one criteria you think should be added to evaluate future industry leaders? I think it's very key to see not just their current successes, but their ambition and vision for the future. So I think obviously, in many of the cases, we uh, look at the historical kind of successes and achievements. I think the question is, what is the ambition? What does the person want to do as part of their job versus as part of their bigger identity? And I think that the main thing for me is just the individuality, the identity, which is driving it rather than, you know, sitting on a project because your boss told you to do so. So I imagine that anything to do with a big vision, whether it's helping others, whether it's transforming the industry, whether it's building your own business, whether it's inspiring millions of people is something which I will be looking in this submission. Perfect. Number 16. You've overcome significant personal and professional challenges. What's your strategy for maintaining resilience in the face of setbacks? Well, I mean, I say that I'm very resilient, but it sometimes does go downhill as well. I think I am very tenacious, definitely. And I think I'm very resilient in my um, spirit, not always in my body. So I think the body does break down at times, which is disappointing. Um, I think what I'm trying to do more now is just to be patient with my body as it comes up with my spirit of ambition <laughs> and tenaciousness because it doesn't always uh, do that at the same time and at the same speed. <laughs> I relate to that. A hundred percent, I relate to that. Good yeah. answer. Um, number 17. If you could create a new course for the London School of Economics, blending your expertise in math finance and technology what would it be i would probably do something about the personal brand and i think it's more like not just that you do technology for the sake of doing technology and the new innovative ideas but how do you maximize your let's say not necessarily the sales but kind of maximize your impact and i think what is happening more and more in the industry net now is that companies are recognizing that it's not necessarily the company brand which people are relating to but it's the people's brand and like if they can showcase the good people if the people feel that they can be showcased in the industry or if there is a bit more of a personality in addition to all the financial technological challenges I think the more people exhibit it and the more the companies show it, whether it's junior people or the mid, mid management or the senior people, I think it's important. I think historically it was much more focused on the senior people and them being the face of the company. I think the more we do it across and we get the younger generations to talk, to be seen, to be heard and recognized, not just, you know, in some awards, but more like whether it's corporate websites, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's something even talking about the key projects and challenges and uh, trends, uh, I think it needs to be done at various levels. 100% agree. 100% agree. I actually wrote a book that complements what you just said. Number 18, you're aiming to inspire 50 million people globally. What's the most unexpected way someone has told you they've been inspired by your work? 
I went on a date recently and the guy came and he said he doesn't want to date me because I'm a public figure because he watched my TED talk and too many people watched it. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, very disappointed because I had to travel for an hour to meet the person. And I was disappointed he didn't tell me that an hour in advance because I wouldn't have travel. But it was kind of funny. I mean, uh, practically speaking, I don't know. I mean, people seem to be complimentary most of the time. I don't tend to have like haters or anything. I think it's a little bit, how do I manage it with the day-to-day -day work? Because still to the topic of the personal brand, personal brand is not always the number one thing which the corporates are looking for. Mm. So it's just how do you go with your mission and with your values and with the day-to-day -day life and just make it work in terms of time and commitment. Good answer, thank you. Number 19, in your opinion, What's the most underrated skill in the tech industry today and how can professionals develop it? So I think one of the things in the technology is anything to do with creating a brand. And I don't mean the brand out of technology because we know the brands of Microsoft and Amazon and Google, but the brand of yourself as a brand, right? And then through your brand, you sell the technology, whatever that is. I think this is not something which is being taught right now. I think it's something which is an opportunity because if you imagined you had, I don't know, Steve Jobs, but it wasn't just one Steve Jobs. You had thousands of Steve Jobs from Apple who would be selling Apple and you would not just remember Steve Jobs, you would remember those thousand people. It's likely that more people are going to buy iPhones potentially. And I think at the time right now, it's more done, I guess, maybe through the influences or through the celebrities who are more in the art and media and actors. But you don't have to sell it through that way. You can do it through your own people in technology as long as you, you know, let them highlight their knowledge story, mm -hmm. the personal brand. Gifts, talents, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. That's those three things right there for me are the secret to the fourth industrial revolution. That is the opportunity that we all have is that we can monetize our gifts, talents, and intellectual property on our own multimedia, omnimedia monetization platforms. Like we have that. And most of us, or what's available, if you were willing to do the work, is we can build our own independent media companies with virtually no money with the tools that are available today. And that gives us the opportunity to monetize all of those things, have multiple revenue streams. Like that is an opportunity that we all have. And that excites me because that works for the underserved populations that may not have access to other jobs. Like for me, I'm not getting hired by a, a corporation. They're, they would, I, I don't want that kind of job anyway, but they're not going to hire me. Like I'm not going to get a job. I don't have access to that. I don't have the educations that they would demand, but I'm also very gifted and very smart and very talented but instead of having to go look for a job, I decided to monetize my life. And that's how I set it up. And that's what I'm passionate about teaching because not everybody has access to the, or I'm sorry, the what is available for us is that opportunity now. And I'm grateful for those technological changes because of that, because it gives us a chance to play. A lot of times, most of us never get a seat at the table, but these new media tools that are available to us all give us an opportunity to have a seat at a table that we normally wouldn't be invited to. And that's exciting for me. Yeah, but I think it's also, I mean, resonating with that is if you don't have a stage, you create your own stage. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> I created my own stage and it works. Anyone can do it. We don't need, for instance, if people want to make movies now or be on TV shows or even act or create their own or be in commercials, you don't need to be in Los Angeles to do that. You can be in Oklahoma. You can be in Minnesota. You can be in London. You can be anywhere. You could be in Africa somewhere. You can be anywhere because we all have the same, we have access to the same things now for the most part. Now there's infrastructure issues and things like that. And some, not everyone has laptops, but we're getting closer where we all have the same access. And that's pretty exciting. Number, uh, oops, I lost where I was at. Number 19, I think. Mm. Oh, here we go. In your opinion, no, I already asked you that. Number 20, if you could send a message to your younger self when you first arrived in the UK, 
What would you say in exactly 10 words? I don't know the 10 words, but I think that you can make whatever you want to make. Fast. Third, I think close. <laughs> it's close to 10. It works. All right, last question. Looking ahead, what's one bold prediction you have for the intersection of technology and society in the next decade? I think it's definitely more and more people will be more close to technology, starting with the schools and the universities and subsequently the jobs, because we see that, you know, the non-technical professions are using technology in some shape or form. We are advocating for the fact that more school children have access to technology from the younger age. So it's no longer something which is an industry which is limited, but it's more an industry available to everybody. It's not just from the jobs, but just like the general understanding of what's happening and the exposure to the tooling, exposure to the things that could help you in the day-to-day -day life. So I think it's just this whole idea and concept of putting this closer between the humanity and the technology and making it work in a safe and secure way. Well said. Well, geez, you survived the 21 questions pretty easily. I should have tried harder. Um, but I would like to give you the opportunity. This is the final thing. This is not a question, uh, but you survived 21 questions. Thank you. I loved all of your answers. I learned a lot and really appreciate your insight. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to give you the opportunity to have the final word where you can plug anything you want to plug, promote anything you want. And then, of course, if there's anything on your heart you want to share, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I think my story is I recently incurred a disability, so I actually had to leave my corporate job and I'm changing a little bit the type of work which I'm working on. So I'm setting my own business, which is called Unique Bold You, and it's pretty much focused on the various things I had to overcome myself as an immigrant uh, from Russia, from the working class, and all the different things you know i learned so that it's just much faster for the other people to have access to it's things like you know how do you build a personal brand how can you be on stages how can you win awards how can you kind of persevere in your career how can you be different if you're a woman if you're a disabled person and i'm like it's a lot of the content which i learned through the years which i don't think was available to me when i kind of came over and um, it's a lot of the things which I hope can improve uh, the society, broadly speaking. And it's something which I'm quite passionate about is my project. So it's something which I started and uh, something which I plan to build as much as possible. Do you want to tell people where they can find you? LinkedIn. There is going to be a link to it. Yeah, there, there is. Of course, there's going to be links everywhere. Okay, but you have to have the final word. Well, I mean, I thank you for the show. I hope to make a change to the world as much as possible. I mean, uh, I think I'm pretty good in what I do. I think I can share my insights with many more people uh, in a more detailed way than just the show. And uh, I just hope that you know that there is more of equality in the society despite the gender and the disabilities and all the other adversities that people can face and you know that everybody has a seat at the table and the voice to be heard 